<laughs> hey, Doki. Um, thanks for letting me know on my mouse. <laughs> That's a cool symbol. Um, cool. All right, great. <laughs> okay, I got my phone open so I can see messages. So I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to share my entire screen. And it's been a real challenge, you know, to get motivated to write this thing, but or continue writing it, but I got to work on it. I have to. It's just the reality. So, all right. Let me pray. Father God, um, you know, I know that these are not the most entertaining videos, um, but I think they do benefit people in some type of way. Maybe other people are in the same situation as me. I know it benefits me to be able to share um, what I'm doing uh, in my preparation to somebody else. It gives me clarity. And so, Lord, I'm just asking that your Holy Spirit uh, illuminate your word, help me organize things um and help the audience comprehend and think about things they've never thought before and uh help them in their own personal study Jesus and we pray amen okay so basically what i gotta do is i need to go read through flow even though i've already gone over this i need to read through flow so the basis for the dispensational premillennial faith i'm going to change the title I've used that title before, as I said. So one basis for the dispensation of premillennial faith is a literal interpretation of biblical covenants as a basis for the temporal meditorial kingdom, which requires ultimate fulfillment in the Messianic millennial kingdom. This paper will trace the relationship between the biblical covenants and the TMK through nine movements. It integrates other bases for the dispensation of premillennial faith, such as hermeneutics, church history, and theology within these nine movements. And that's what I did in a previous paper, and I put that there to uh, preserve what I did. So, the TMK briefly just supposed with the Eternal uh, Universal Kingdom. I'll probably change that title to something like the Two Kingdoms, Two Types of Kingdom, or something like that. But anyway, the Eternal Universal Kingdom is a given. It existed before the Trinitarian God created anything, and it included his objective lordship over creation. The scriptural basis for the eternal universal kingdom is not disputed by any conservative theologian. In contrast, the temporal meditorial kingdom is both distorted and disputed by theologians across the spectrum. The best counter is a synthetic summary of the theocratic meditorial kingdom. The theocratic meditorial kingdom is temporal because it relates to earth and human history and culminates in a future Messianic millennial kingdom that has a physical locality. The rule of the the TMK is mediated indirectly through humans that represent God. This involves God's providential miraculous hand. The TMK is also dependent on humans to respond. Movement from creation to Bible. The TMK takes many forms throughout human history and it has its beginning in Genesis. Dr. Honer, this is in Andy Wood's book, would tell his students that the theme of the coming kingdom is first mentioned in Genesis 1-1. This is also where the eternal universal kingdom, the Trinity, creates the TMK. The Trinity has eternally been in fellowship with itself positionally. So fellowship, uh, I, I know this language, but I don't need it for this paper. So I'm just going to put fellowship with itself. So fellowship existed before creation and before evil ever did. Uh, fellowship with, uh, it, the Trinity has been in fellowship with itself. Well, we don't need to argue in this paper that fellowship existed before, so we don't need that. The TMK began when God created a realm consistent of time, space, and matter. Even though he delegated the angels to have a role in his plan, angels were never given the earth to rule. God gave that responsibility to humans before the fall. When God placed Adam in the garden, he was in fellowship with God as he served in the degraded of king. Well, how about I actually say a word right here? Hey, two natures. When God placed Adam in the garden, he was in fellowship with God as he served in the TMK of God. This also involved worship and work. Adam and Eve were the first TMK administrators to rule the earth from Eden. 
when Adam and Eve named the animals, he was the uh, Adam named the animals. He was following the example of God, who delegated authority to rule over the earth. Okay, so we got a lot of this rule over the earth stuff. This kind of redundant. So we're gonna need to uh, get rid of some of this. Let's see. Yeah, we we use this color for now. To rule over the earth. To rule over the earth. Sick and tired of me saying to rule over the earth. Um. So that means we can condense some of this. All right. So let's look at this one by one again. So we're talking about the Trinity. We're talking about delegating to angels. God gave us by humans before the earth. All right. God gave the responsibility to humans to rule over the earth let's just say that to rule over the earth before the fall all right do i need to mention before the fall i mean they had the responsibility to rule over the let's just take out before the fall for now bring this in here like that when god placed out was in fellowship with god as he served in the tmk of god Okay, well, that's great. He's in fellowship, but God sustains creation, delegates to man, and through man, he restores fellowship to creation where it no longer grows. Well, that's great, but I don't think it's needed. Uh, I'll put it at the end of the paper, and maybe we'll pull it in somewhere else. So that allows me to erase that footnote. Wherever it was, what was it? 11, footnote 11. Okay. When God placed Adam and he's in fellowship with God as he served in the TMK of God. Uh, instead of when, let's just make this God place Adam in the garden to serve. Because I don't, I don't really need this uh, fellowship language for this paper. That came from another paper. And one day in the future, I can always combine that into God placed Adam in the garden to worship. Uh, and serve. Let's see, to, to, to serve. Got serve in a, of God. Really, we know it's God, so we don't even need the word of God there. All right. This also involves worship and work. So I could combine these to serve, worship, and work. All right. To serve, worship, and work. And then this allows me to take uh, I can combine 215 here. This erases this. Adam and Eve were the first theocratic administrators to rule the earth for meeting. All right, well, we don't need this because we already said report. they gave the responsibility to humans. So, uh, we don't need the statement about Adam and Eve because that's implied above. Um, when Adam named the animals, he's following example, God who delegates authority, uh, to rule over the earth. Well, I don't need that. I mean, maybe I'll put it back in if I, if, if, if I get more room, but if there were to be channels. Um, this is good, but this is not needed. This is a bridge to connect it to Abraham because this channel of blessing language is used for there. So we don't need that. All right. God gave boundaries for maintaining fellowship with God as he served God in the Edenic Covenant arrangement. That's true, but it's not needed for this paper. God gave the responsibility of believers to be ministering before the Mosaic Law Code was given. And... So, all right, so this is not, none of this is needed. Uh, yeah, none of this is needed. 
serpent wanted to break fellowship between God and humanity. Okay. All right. So we're to chapter two, at least. In the divine judgment, given that God requires accountability arrangement, very appropriate fellowship with God brings to importantly, including the saving of Adam and Eve. At least they can fellowship with God. All right. So this is all just still fellowship stuff. It's good, but it's just not needed for this paper. Okay, from that point on, they had to bring and set both sacrifice according to conscience. All right, so this is about salvation. The Adamic covenant introduced position of salvation, making fellowship with God possible in a fallen world. Even though evil has tried to hinder God's plan, God can still judge and offer salvation because sin entered the picture of humankind rebelled. Okay, so there's some stuff in here that I could talk about salvation. I'm going to keep this for now. However, humankind rebelled and joined Satan's kingdom by sinning. Okay. So now we got the serpent and uh, serp. So before salvation is ever introduced, we got to talk about the serpent. Um, so I think we'll take this, move this up here. Let's see. This is all about the serpent. Twelve. All right, this is good, but it can go somewhere else. So let's stick it down here. And back up to here. All right. The serpent wanted to break the fellowship between God and humanity. That's true, but do I need it? I mean, I'm not I've taken out the fellowship motif for the most part. So I really don't need it. Um so So we're just stating the fact the serpent usurped its theocratic structure from the first humans by tempting. All right, so we'll keep that the same. Now, these are questions about the serpent. So I think what I need to do is I need to outline some things. All right, so that's about the kingdom. That's about the garden. So... Movement from creation to Babel. The kingdom. I'm just going to call this the serpent. All right. So that whole section is about the serpent. And then the seed... Where do we put the seed? All right. Let's see. We'll, we'll move this. We'll move this up here so we have the serpent then we have the seed so let's just put in the word the seed seed promise you could say oh we could do the serpent threat or the serpent something and then the seed promise we can come back to that and fix that all right Separation from God. And then this goes back into salvation.
Let's see. From that point on, I had to bring acceptable sacrifice. Okay. So this actually goes before that. So this is where I'm kind of going. I should be going verse by verse uh, in Genesis. So things should be in that order as I'm going through this right now. It's not quite there. Um... So maybe that's what I need to do. Maybe I need to slow down and go in order right here through this section. So we got Genesis 3.15. Uh, when God promised that they would have children, a surprise and response. All right. So, yeah, we need to bring in some passages here to get things going in order. We're not doing Greek right now, so we can close that stuff. I was teaching intermediate Greek, so I got all this stuff going. Maybe it's better if I just close off. Just give me a second, guys. All right. Come on. There it goes. Genesis three. And we'll just start 15. So the serpent is mentioned, right? Adam and Eve, their sin. So I got to look and see, did I even address Adam and Eve's sin? Um, that's the kingdom part. The serpent. Okay. So this isn't just about the serpent, but it's also about the sin. So we could say the serpent, temptation, and sin. So the serpent usurped the theocratic structure from the first humans by temptation through an inverted order approach where he, as a creature, chooses to go after the queen of the garden instead of Adam and Eve. Perhaps the serpent Probably I need to insert a, a, a range verses here. So maybe what's that? Three, one through six or something. One, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman. All right. She gave to her husband. Okay. So I would say one through five. Genesis. Three, one through five. Okay. And I already have accounted for this, so I'm going to remove these highlights. All right, so the serpent usurped the theocratic structure for the first humans by temptation through an inverted order approach where he, as creature, chooses to go after the queen of the garden instead of King Adam. And so this is me. Perhaps the serpent heard Adam's initial response to seeing the woman, uh, that the woman. So this is where he cries out, Whoa, man. Uh, uh, 2.23. Uh, with initial response to seeing the woman. 2.23. Genesis 2 20 that led him to believe that he could use Adam's intensity for the woman to turn him against God. 
The serpent may have wanted Adam to exalt the gift from God over God who gave the gift. That appears to be the test and temptation that arises in every stewardship responsibility at some point. While this may have been the serpent's immediate goal, his ultimate goal was to replace humanity as the theocratic miniaturical kingdom administrator. Did the serpent, a fallen angel, actually possess the title of king of earth after the fall? Or is he a pretender? The attack came was also against the creator creature distinction. Or did the serpent merely disqualify Adam from filling the role perfectly? Satan is the first replacement theologian. What role would the serpent crusher accomplish? Is he the savior seed? So this is about the seed part. If not for the Bible given titles and names of Satan that indicated Satan succeeded in some sense in the fall, there may be reason to question if the TMK was transferred to him at that time and is under sway like a mother over her unconscious child. Christ must succeed where Adam fell. Some other significant results that came from the fall of humanity, including the introduction of counterfeit religion, a break in fellowship between God and humans, the tendency to not accept responsibility for sin, Jesus' service plan to under God's creative order uh, to under. Well, this is good, but it's not necessary for this paper. Hmm. After humanity rebelled and joined the serpent's counterfeit kingdom of darkness, God revealed his attention to the story when he gave the seed promise. Okay. There's a couple things in here that I'll move around, but we're not in too bad a shape right now. Genesis 3, uh, 15. So we got 314 is where he's focusing on the serpent. He said, I think it's 14, is it? The Lord's, no, 13, 14, yeah. Got to turn these notes off. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, curse for you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and the dust you will eat all the days of your life. 14, all right. So if I'm going to introduce the serpent... Yeah, definitely to move some things around, but it's fine. So 15, and I will put imagery between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on your head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Okay, so that's where we're at right now. Let me call this the seed promise and messianic salvation. could actually be called the seed promise of messianic salvation. Hmm. I don't know. I'll play around with that later. Okay. Genesis 3.15 reveals that someone would fulfill the role of the serpent crusher. The one that defeated the serpent would also be the one to rule the earth. The promise was part of the content fallen humanity had to believe to be positionally saved. For them, positional salvation meant not being under the penalty of death that they most likely understood to mean eternal separation from God. When God promised they would have children, this was a surprise to them. In response, Adam called his wife's name Eve since he believed God that the life would go that life would go on after the fall. God then provided for them tunics of skin, implying that he killed the first animal and instituted the first sacrifice. The first parents taught this to their children also, and they were accountable to God for it. From that point on, they had to bring an acceptable sacrifice according to their conscience. The Adamic covenant introduced positional salvation, making fellowship with God possible in the fallen world. And that's true, but it's not needed. Even though evil had tried to hinder God's plan, God could still judge and offer uh, positional salvation. That's true, but we don't need it. Um... 
God started salvation because sin entered into the picture. Well, we can we can put this sin into the picture. And are we going to rebel and join Satan's kingdom? All right, so let's. Um, I'll keep that, but I'm definitely going to move that around. After the fall, God still made it possible for people to have fellowship with him through instituting the sacrificial system. And, uh, okay, that's good. Um, his divine judgment required another covenant to make fellowship with God possible in a fallen world. I'm not focusing on the, uh, the Adamic covenant. Uh, God restored the potential for fellowship with God by provision from God and placing God to substitute your sacrifice. That's great for fellowship, but we're not focusing on fellowship in this paper. The evil of sin broke the fellowship with God man had with the garden and the judge of sin allowed for the resurrection of fellowship with God by salvation and afterward for worship. Once again, same thing is that we're not focusing on fellowship in this paper. But God was not really focused on making spiritual salvation possible and restoring the means of fellowship with him. His prophecy of the serpent crusher relates to his plan for deliverance of the entire earth. This is messianic salvation where all of creation is underneath the last Adam in fulfillment of what some call the Adamic covenant. That's fine. I can leave that. Later revelation will tell how the theocratic Mediterranean kingdom will be reestablished. However, since the author Genesis is writing to prepare the second generation Israelites for going into the promised land. They are well aware of the primeval history setting the stage for God's plan through the patriarchs. Okay. The disobedience of humanity at the Tower of Babel is the key backdrop. All right. So this is the, this is going to move around here. Because I talk about uh, Cain and Abel and stuff right here. So let's plug that in. Um. Let's just cut it right there. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll put this in here for right now. So this is Satan was influencing Cain to murder Abel. God uses the divine institutions to put encumbrances on Satan, but Satan is always working behind the scenes. If there were no fall, there would be no human force in another to work. Failure of man is seen in Cain's life. Uh, Namek made a name for himself. Nimrod does the same. Okay, this part here, actually, it ties into the Exodus stuff. So I'm going to put it down here. All right. So... Okay, so it looks like I'm I'm being too premature and talking about this right here. Uh, we read someone fulfilled the role of the serpent crusher. The one that defeated the serpent would also be the one to rule the earth. All right, let's see here. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe I need to leave it alone. Okay. So we're going back up in here and we're looking at this serpent temptation and sin. The seed promise of messianic salvation. 
sacrificial okay um so in the disobedience humanity at the tower of Babel's why god's plan is bigger than spiritual salvation yeah i i could see why i'm saying that but let me just let me just read it for flow he would not have been hindered by babel to bring the salvation since it's always been available since the fall it would not technically hinder messiah from coming but if god is to rule over the physical land through his seed crusher then he must defeat the serpent and retake the land the story of Abraham is the beginning of this move to redeeming the earth through his descendants, through Israel, and through the Messiah from Judah. God was not merely making individual salvation possible for people after the fall. Okay. So back to Genesis. Yet, Abram is told by God to make his name great. Okay. Um. This does not flow. I'm going to move this um, It just looks like chopped up notes. I need it. It's there. Okay. Um, so what about Cain? All right, so the question, these are what are called interpretive questions. Like, I'm like, have I addressed the issue of Cain? So for right now, we see that I do talk about Cain right here. So um, what about Cain? I could stick this here to remind me. What about the prophecy for, for Flood 9-7? I saw something about the prophecy about the flood. Um, okay. If this goes into Nimrod. We don't need to talk about Nimrod yet because we're not there yet. Um, so we think this prophecy for the flood. If everyone respect, there will be no need for murder. Okay, this actually can go into uh, this part right here. I think can go into when we get into the Exodus part. So let's move it. All right, so so what little do I want to say about the flood? Because this all goes into here. So maybe I need to just say something briefly about the flood. Um, okay. And then the next incident after the flood is the Tower of Babel, which is where we're in the section now. Um, we're going to use this part to say something about the flood, the Noah Covenant. All right. Then we got Genesis 11 here. Genesis 11 is a description of why the nations were too corrupt for a theocracy to rise from it. Okay. The serpent knew of God's intentions to restore the theocratic administrative kingdom, so he sought to replace it with his version. 
Rather than being monotheistic, the counterfeit by the point was polytheistic. Babel was the gateway to the gods, and the serpent one of humanity believed that the way to become a god is to align with the so-called gods led by him. Babel was the result of the rebellion of humanity to spread out and fulfill the mandate of the Noah covenant. Humanity was to bear God's name, not make a name for themselves. They were to be dependent on the one true God and interdependent on each other. Instead, the creator creature distinction is attacked yet again. Okay. That sounds good. So God will scatter the first attempt of new world government religion order. All right. The, the, I believe that the, the bold font, if I remember right, are notes from Andy Woods uh, lectures. So God will scatter the first attempt, a new world religion order. This is the origin of nations and ethnicity. This is why God cannot use the existing nations to channel his blessing. Since the Savior is going to restore the theocracy, God creates a new nation. What is the base for the mother child cult? Yeah, I don't like that mother child cult stuff. It had a ripple effect with global impact during the Babylon captivity. It was in Israel. God sent them into captivity, purged them of that system. Did God extend it through the Ad Adamic covenant? That was my question. How does this relate to humanity having the responsibility of representing him to the TMK? Okay, so these notes no longer needed. I think they're already reflected in the text for the most part. So I can erase these. Now, here's some more interpretive questions that I have where we're actually talking about the Abrahamic covenant. So, this is about Babel. Okay, so we can put Babel. Babel and the need for uh, theocracy. We'll just call it that for now. Okay, so now what I did was the first movement that I trace is the movement from creation to Babel. And since I've done that, then the next movement is going to be the Abrahamic covenant. So movement two. The Abrahamic Covenant. All right. So now I can erase that one because I already accounted for it. Now I'm going to move this down. And we'll fix the level headings later on. All right. So this is where we're going to put the Abrahamic Covenant in here. Now I may have talked about it some in some other places um which may cause me to move things around i'm not sure yet so what is the relationship of seed today we're here with code is it expanded or elaborated how does this relate to the second atom okay so at this point we need to interact with elliot johnson on this um this is the uh, three three central issues in contemporary dispensationalism, uh, and uh, so right here, this is a Zoda work. He has a newer work. Uh, my Kindle's not open. I don't know why. Um, Where to go, Kindle? All right. He's got a dispensational biblical theology, which is more updated. But I'm kind of using older stuff for right now. That way, my articulation of his older stuff may not necessarily be the same thing as his articulation of, in his newer book. And then that will allow me to write about the topic freshly, but at the same time, pull from the ideas that I've learned in the past. All right. The structure of the promissory covenants. The Abrahamic covenant is a unilateral, unconditional agreement given to Abraham in Genesis 15. This covenant is merely a formal expression of relationship that already existed between Yahweh and Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Yahweh appeared revealing his will to Abraham, 12, 1 through 3, and Abram responded to Yahweh had spoken, 12, 4. The relationship thus introduced was unilateral since the terms of relationship were spoken by Yahweh alone. 
within the terms were promises unconditionally stated, even though they followed a call to leave his family in his homeland, 12.1 in Acts 7. That call was then followed by promises, the first of which was a promise of land, which Yahweh would show him. And in previous videos on this, we've, we've gone into the issue about the conditionality. Did it affect the promise? You know, those issues. Was he obedient and disobedient? So I'm not going into that right now. Some would interpret the call as a condition based on which the promises were rewards. If Abraham responded adequately, then he would be rewarded by what Yahweh promised. But as the narrative unfolds the response to the call, the response could not be identified as meeting a condition and thus is adequate. Abraham arrived in the land God promised in spite of leaving with Terah and taking Lot, his nephew. Further, Abram uh, arrived in spite of the delay in Haran and maintained his relationship to promise in spite of departing from the land with disobedience. So while obedience was associated with receiving what God had promised, it was neither a condition of that relationship with Yahweh nor a condition based on which was rewarded by what was promised. Rather, the relationship was unilaterally originated and the promises unconditionally given. Obedience was associated with the occasion for Abraham being blessed as necessary, but the promise was realized on, only because Yahweh was merciful. Okay. The promise given to Abram. The promise given to Abram were three kinds, land, descendants, and blessing, or land, seed, and blessing, as some people put it. Land, God first promised to give land to Abram's seed, and later promised land to Abram and his seed. The land was promised to be owned forever. Descendants. The descendants who were spoken about were going to be numerous, and those who were spoken to were going to be recipients of what was promised. When this, I like how he makes a distinction between those that talked about and those who were talking to. When descendants, Zerah, are referred to, an ambiguity exists because of the collective noun seed. It can refer to one descendant or many, and the context will provide the immediate clue to resolve the ambiguity. Okay. Blessings. The blessings were not only personal, but also were to be mediated for others. The role of mediation is what Caird called the job description. The job was greater than anything Abram could realize alone, as well as anything Abraham's descendants ever did accomplish. Yet the promise provides a continuing basis for expecting that his descendants would be mediators of God's blessing to all nations. The pro and we, we made a video talking about Karen's situation, job vacancy uh, illustration it's in the same series. The promise of land and the promise of posterity both seemed tenuous in Abraham's life. Almost 10 years had passed without any land or even a descendant. Then, as Yahweh repeated his promise as an assurance that his reward would be great, Abraham burst into a question. Abraham's question concerning an heir was met with a clarification of the promise, uh, promising a physical descendant. That promise was amplified with the specification of many descendants. Then Abraham believed uh, and God in his word of promise. The covenant instituted with Abram. God's promise, as Abram was in need of further assurance, was confirmed by the institution of a covenant. The covenant features a land grant agreement given to Abraham's seed. So I think one thing I need to do, because I've written papers on this, is the movement, uh, movement to the Abrahamic covenant. I'm going to call it the Abrahamic promise. Uh, or yeah, the Abrahamic covenant. And so I would say the preparatory promise. And then that section would focus on the promise that was given for the covenant. And then the, uh, the, um, the promise formalized. And so that focuses on the Abrahamic covenant. All right. So there's some, little bit of structure there that I can use. Okay. So, yeah, this is the book. Let me see if the cover will show. Yeah, this is the book. Oh, that does not show very well. A, a Dispensational Biblical Theology by Elliot Johnson. And so this was written in 2016. And so it has more updated stuff. The thing I'm reading right now is from the 90s, 97, I think, or something. But anyway, um, 
The covenant featured a land grant agreement given to Abraham's seed. The extent of the territory was de delineated in geographic and ethnographic terms. God contracted the solemn covenant with the patriarch who became the passive beneficiary of his unilateral obligation unconditionally assumed as a legal document. That covenant provided Adam with a title deed to the land. Okay, so Adam gets a title deed to the land according to this, which was then passed on to Isaac and to Jacob, and because of the relationship we had with Abraham, while the covenant was instituted with Abraham, fulfillment was not inaugurated with either Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, as none came into possession of any land by means of the promise. So in other words, they're given the land in title D, but they're not actually given the land. They never possess the land. Okay. The provision of the covenant focused on the land geographically. I need to shut my door one second, guys. Okay. The provision of the covenant focused on the land geographically and ethnically defined, but other provisions that had been promised were included in later summaries. The climatic and concluding provision had already been promised at the outset in Genesis 12.3, but was repeated for decisive emphasis. In your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. So the, this is repeated in 22.18, 26.4, 28.14. In addition, a further provision was repeated about the multiplication of the seed at 22.17, 26.4, 28.13, to become a nation. The structure of the Davidic covenant. So we're going to talk about the Davidic covenant now, even though we're not there yet, just so people could get an overview of the big picture, how some of this relates. The structure of the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant is introduced in 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 17. The covenant is then reflected upon by David in Psalms 2 and by other psalmists later in the history of the kingdom, Psalms 89 and 132. In addition, Yahweh revealed an oracle and an oath to David concerning his anointed, who is also Lord, Psalms 110. The basic structure is revealed in these passages as a unilateral covenant with promises unconditionally assured in their outcome. While there's no record of its institution, the terms are referred to as a covenant, Psalms 89. Further, it's doubtful that the promise of David's house is a reward for David's desire to build God a house. Rather, God's promise is a stroke of unmerited favor unilaterally given. Okay. The promise to build the Davidic covenant. In distinction to the attention given by Blazing, a uh, progressive dispensationalist, to the Davidic house, Equal attention ought to be given to the Davidic throne and kingdom. Each one of these three components complement with each other. A Davidic house refers to a, di a dynastic, yeah, that's how you say it, a succession of rulers in which a son was promised in each generation who will be qualified to reign. Deuteronomy 17 announces God's plan for a monarchy, while 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 17 and Psalms 84 announce the king will be a Davidic descendant. A Davidic kingdom refers in distinction to the realm of reign, which would include a chosen people as descendants of Abraham. So there's the passages and a chosen land, 1 Chronicles 17. And we'll go into detail about these passages later on. This is just a flyover of the main argument. A Davidic throne refers to the chair of state. Literally, it is a seat. But it is used as a symbol that refers to the power and authority of that reign, exercised while the king was ruling in that kingdom. When Yahweh promises an eternal house, Yahweh assures David that at least his right to reign in Jerusalem would never be abandoned. The power symbolized in David's throne was theocratic, political, and righteous. However, the existence in Jerusalem of a continuing throne and kingdom was contingent upon the second feature of the structure of the covenant related to the house. The promise of a special relationship with David's son. In spite of the ancient Near Eastern setting, the language has nothing to do with physical descendant from God or from divine kingship. Yeah, it has to do with adoption language, I think. In the context of progressive revelation, this is the language of adoption. Yahweh would adopt the king and share his life as a father does with the son. It is the same language Yahweh used to describe his adoption of the nation to be his son 
in Exodus 4. In this history, the adoption of the king refers to, uh, features him as representative son of the national son. Okay, so you got the idea. You got the national son, but then within that, you also have a representative of that. Sort of like whenever um, he said Pharaoh should be a prophet unto you, and you should be a god unto him. So you have this order that you have Aaron, Moses, and then God uh, provided two important privileges. Okay. The son, if he were disobedient, would be disciplined like a wayward child. The discipline would not go beyond parental correction. This pledge referred initially to Solomon as the rest of the sentence in the next verse made clear, but it was coupled with the promise of an unending dynasty. Verse 15 asserts that the grant of kingship will remain in effect regardless of the behavior of David's sons. Such grants might be patrimonial in that they are sanctioned by adoption of the vassal by the king and in special cases, inalienable, in that they were not conditioned upon the future behavior of the descendants of the grantee. Thus, discipline was promised in the context of both assurance and hope of a father-son relationship that would not end. Two, the son adopted by the father was promised the privilege of making requests for an enlarged inheritance. Although Psalms 2 is not attributed to David in the Psalter, Acts 4.25 ascribes the psalm to David. Thus, the psalm envisions the context of David's reign with such an astonishing and senseless rejection of God's rule and ruler did occur. The language seems appropriate for David, who was repeatedly under attack. In the context of such instances, God spoke by David to voice his response and enlarge upon the pledge of adoption given to David's heirs. These words in Psalms 2.8 would have been originally spoken by David, a prophet, and then may have been read by the dynasty of kings and the coronation rite of each king. As the word today suggests, it marks the moment the new sovereign formally took up the title, combined with his inheritance and titles. Carod would call these words the name son, medicants, mendicants, meaning words thrown out and not fully grasped object. The Old Testament is full of such words, and part of its inexhaustible usefulness to us lies in its majestic uh, mendicancy. Kidner summarizes the same point. Once again, in addressing the king as son, the Old Testament has introduced a theme which underdeveloped suits its immediate context, but outgrows it utterly as its implications fully unfold. The Davidic covenant left a stamp of balanced expectation on each generation that followed. On the one hand, the Davidic covenant consisted of the inalienable rights for David's house, but on the other hand, it consisted of the conditional warning of fatherly discipline uh, open to any generation. While the warning threatened the survival of any individual king, it also assured the longevity of the dynasty because no wicked king can remove God's blessing, nor would he remain unattended by God and thus risk gradual decay. Different psalms reflected upon the expectation created by the covenant's terms that the king's response to God, Psalms 132, celebrated the resolve of David in bringing the ark to Jerusalem to focus the attention of the nation on worshiping God. This resolve was matched only by Yahweh's promised resolve to stand by the Davidic dynasty. Kidner captures the heart of God drawing a response from the heart of David as the warmth and wealth of these promises spring from love and require an answer in love for their fulfillment. Similarly, Psalms 89 celebrates the promise of forever in the Davidic covenant, which was based on the sure mercies of God. This celebration issued into a prophetic addition in which Yahweh's firstborn would be elevated above all the Gentile kings. The thrust of the psalm, however, concerned the time of judgment, 89, 39 to uh, 30 to 39, when the promise of forever appeared to go into eclipse. Still, the mercies of Yahweh provided the confidence to pray to restore the love and kindness of the David, Psalms 89, 46 to 52, in Yahweh's truth. The hope of an eternal throne remaining remained resting in the sure mercies of Yahweh in spite of judgment that came. Thus, what did the Davidic covenant guarantee? Did it anticipate the discipline of foreign invasion to capture a disobedient king? The promises provided three assurances. One, a descendant of David would be born in each generation who would meet the qualifications to be king. 
Although God could anoint the Davidic son to be king when the house was under discipline, he would not necessarily anoint him as king. Nevertheless, God's promise guaranteed an eternal house to David. Two, the descendants of Abraham will continue to exist with the land promised subject to be occupied in the formation of the kingdom. Three, Yahweh continually possessed the right to delegate authority and power and promise readiness to enthrone the descendant of his chosen, choosing on the occasion of the descendant's reception. These promise assurances were all contingent upon God's discipline of any or all descendants. A captivity at the hand of Gentile nations could occur, but not at the expense of invalidating any of the promises permanently. One additional feature of the covenant was mentioned in 1 Chronicles 17. I will establish him over my house forever. Blazing uses feature to relate the covenant to Psalms 110. Since the Davidic king builds and maintains the house of God, it is not surprising they describe the scripture as a kind of priest. But the proposal of this relationship between the Davidic covenant and Psalms 110 is unwarranted for two reasons. The relationship between the anointed one and the Aaronic priesthood had already been established when Eli and his sons had been judged. The Aaronic priesthood was to walk before my anointed, which means to function as a royal priest, to serve the king as priest. The judgment on the priesthood anticipated this promise in 1 Chronicles 17 in the Davidic covenant. And two, Psalms 110 introduced Messiah into a new ministry unrelated to any provision of the Davidic covenant. Psalms 110 contains a new oracle and a fresh decree. Unlike the decree in Psalms 2, which explored the father-son relationship more fully and the relationship of Psalms 89, which seized on the clause forever, which the turn of events seemed to flatly contradict, Psalms 110 introduces a new relationship and ministry. The new decree focuses on a heavenly shared throne and the oracle on a Melchizedek priestly ministry from the throne rather than an earthly delegated throne in Jerusalem and an Aaronic priestly ministry. This distinction between a heavenly and an earthly throne has been recognized and maintained in both Psalms 2 and 89. In Psalms 2, he who sits in the heaven shall laugh at senseless rebellion on earth against Yahweh's anointed. Psalms 89 recognize the throne above the throne. Thus, the strictly heavenly ministry is new and unexpressed in the Davidic covenant. Finally, the heavenly ministry of Melchizedek is not based on descendant from David as the king and is distinct from Abraham and his line of descendants. In fact, Melchizedek appeared in history without any relation to the descendants of promise and is superior to the chosen. Abraham and his relationship to God. Thus, Psalms 110 introduces a ministry to David concerning his descendants that is not based on the Davidic covenant promises, rather anticipates a relationship and ministry of the one who is equal to God. So basically what he's saying here is that the, the Psalms 110, which talks about the uh, pre, uh, Christ being made a priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek, is a new ministry for the Messiah, but it's not the Davidic covenant. And so this is why traditional dispensationalists or normative or revised, whatever term you want to use for those that are best articulated by Ryrie and Elliot Johnson um, is that that Christ w rules on the throne of God uh, uh, or the right hand according to the priesthood of Melchizedek, but he does not rule on the throne of David yet. So that's what this is talking about here. Um, the structure of the new covenant. So now we'll go into the new covenant because remember the idea is, is that the Abrahamic covenant has sub covenants tied to it. So remember, Abrahamic covenant gives land, seed, and blessing. The sub-covenant for the land covenant uh, is is the Palestinian covenant. The sub-covenant for the Davidic covenant, I mean, the seed aspect is the Davidic covenant. And the sub-covenant for the blessing aspect is the new covenant. The structure of the new covenant. The name a new covenant first appears in Jeremiah, but the idea of a covenant sequencing to the Mosaic covenant is introduced by Isaiah. More recent studies thus begin with the exposition of Jeremiah 31, along with the broadly recognized parallel in Ezekiel 36, but in doing so, overlook the essential perspective. 
Isaiah introduced. Thus, before examining Jeremiah, an examination of Isaiah and the servant covenant is worthy of attention. Isaiah and the servant covenant. The book of Isaiah introduces the Mosaic Covenant with the declaration that the nation is on trial based on the prophetic uh, prosecutors uh, uh, lawsuit presented in terms of violations of the covenant. The prosecutor pronounces that Israel is guilty of violation of the covenant with Yahweh. The nation kings, Ahaz and Hezekiah, and people stand condemned as subject to impending judgment. Then the mood and tone of the prophecies dramatically change with the announcement of deliverance. The demands of such a deliverance are so great that only Yahweh can accomplish it, Isaiah 40. In addition, the arm of Yahweh, the agent of Yahweh, was introduced, who would rule for him, Isaiah 40 and 48. The prominent agent of Yahweh is introduced and briefly featured. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And then the prophet drops any further mention. The treatment raises questions in the reader's mind. Who is Yahweh's arm? What work shall he do? The answer to these questions unexpectedly appears following the introduction of Israel's Yahweh's chosen servant, taken from the ends of the earth. Yahweh was assured of God's help. Then with similar abruptness, Yahweh's servant is introduced, quiet and unobtrusive, who enjoys God's unqualified pleasure and accomplishes justice among the nations. Isaiah speaks of his service for Yahweh. Thus, Isaiah introduces Yahweh's agent, this servant, who is immediately identified with the nation, but who is also the representative of the nation, who serves and accomplishes God's will for the nation. This representative serpent matches in prominence the arm of Yahweh in terms of realizing God's will without limit. So basically what we're saying is that the nation of Israel was God's servant, and but within that nation, there's a representative of the nation that is also God's servant. Just like we were talking about earlier about the the the, um, the, the seed thing and the king thing. The work of this servant is further developed as a new work of Yahweh. Whoa. While the language is usually the basic thoughts can be unpacked, the servant is given as a bing. Covenant of the people. Eichroy interprets the statement to mean that the servant of God, who is defined as the mediator of the covenant to the nation. Winfield speaks of a covenant mediation as the covenant is sponsored by a third party, i.e. through mediation. Mediation of a covenant is especially characteristic of the covenant with God. So the servant of the Lord is the mediating party, serving Yahweh and representing the people. The people with whom Yahweh establishes a covenant are mentioned in distinction to the Gentiles. Thus, Yahweh gives the serpent as a pledge, as the mediator of the agreement with Israel and based on his service. Yahweh assumes an obligation to the people. In other words, the servant of Yahweh is given as the covenant basis of a fresh relationship with Israel. Prior to being given, Yahweh sustains the servant as he serves. I will take hold of your hand, keep you. The covenant with Israel also serves as a light to the Gentiles, who finds their relationship with God brought to light through the servant, servant Israel. The Gentiles will see in him justice. In, in the prophet's continued development, the servant Israel is deaf, blind, and obstinate in disobedience. And yet Yahweh will redeem Israel. In view of that, Yahweh will not remember her sins and will pour my spirit on your descendants. These themes developed in the context of a covenant between Yahweh and his people introduce themes that are developed by Jeremiah. Jeremiah and the New Covenant. Jeremiah addressed a new covenant established with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It is a covenant that is specifically distinct from the broken Mosaic Covenant and the one that will be established in the future, Jeremiah 31. The text that follows spells out the terms of God's agreement and what he pledges. Where singles out four aspects of newness in the covenant agreement from which our summary is adapted. The new mode of implementation of relationship. Yahweh's law will be internalized so that a response to the law 
will be prompted from within rather than a response created by the threat from without. The internalization process will be done by Yahweh himself as he writes his Torah upon their heart. Such a personal process correlates well with Ezekiel 36. No indication of a change in the content of the law is given in the language. The heart was always the focus of the law, but now it becomes the focus of God's personal presence and work. Wolf features the heart as the focus of thinking, reasoning, reflecting, and considering. Without a heart, one is without a clear sense a direction and activity of the will where perception becomes choice and here in obedience. Two, the new scope of relationship. All will know Yahweh from the least to the greatest. To know often implies a personal relationship with Yahweh in Old Testament scriptures. As a result, the covenant community as a whole and individually will have a personal relationship with Yahweh. Thus, no longer will they exhort one another to know Yahweh as the Mosaic Covenant demanded in the community, the decisive evidence of such a comprehensive scope is found in the next promise. Three, the new basis of relationship. Yahweh's forgiveness of sin is full and final, and such forgiveness reconciliation with Yahweh is real. Four, a new national relationship. Yahweh first spoke of a national relationship at the Exodus. The same promise is repeated here. I will be your God and you will be my people. What is new are the mode, scope, and basis that now establish a national relationship, which also includes a personal relationship to every individual of the nation. What has been promised failed in the Mosaic agreements, but now is again promised in the agreements based on the work of the servant of Yahweh. Fulfillment of the Promissory Covenants There is an overwhelming influence among evangelical New Testament students as a result of the agreement of G.E. Ladd, F.F. F. Bruce and I. Howard Marshall, the fulfillment occurred in Christ's first event in an already not yet pattern. So, okay. So, Lad, Bruce, and Marshall have had significant influence in that area. Traditional dispensationalists do not agree that this is an adequate perception to sponsor, nor is it a comprehensive exegesis of fulfillment. Progressive dispensationists have adopted this or a similar overview to explain New Testament fulfillment. Bruce Walkie, great Hebrew scholar, a former dispensationalist, assessed the state of study as the overwhelming convincing evidence in the New Testament for the already fulfillment of Israel's covenants and promises in Christ and his church. Yet, as Lewis Johnson, another good scholar, um, uh, questions the consequence of such a theological inclusion because of the effect it has on sequential interpretation of the Old Testament. The problem with the authority of the New Testament possible to interpret the Old Testament needs careful consideration. I have strong misgivings about this in spite of its sponsorship as biblical. Yeah, so we reject the New Testament priority idea is what he's saying. This active debate indicates the need to examine fulfillment carefully and will begin by considering definitions. On the one hand, the term fulfill has been defined in terms of quantity and space full empty on the other hand the term is used here to refer to statements thus it's more appropriate to define fulfill in a linguistic context where it refers to a commissive statement rather than to think metaphorically as space and quantity so this is where he starts bringing in speech act theory if i remember right um or maybe he does that in a more recent book A promise or a promissory covenant is a commissive statement in which the author commits himself to act in a specified way in the future. Fulfillment is then satisfying of that commitment. Commitments may be satisfied and thus fulfilled when one keeps what has been agreed upon to do. Some issues need further consideration to clarify what is involved in keeping the commitment. First, a commitment is fulfilled only when it's kept with the one addressed as a recipient of the, of the agreement. Second, commitments may take different forms of expression in the Bible. It is either a promise or a covenant. A promise involves a simple agreement or provision to act in the future. A covenant is a formal agreement, uh, often involving a package of related provisions. Thus, a promise is fulfilled when the agreement is kept. A covenant is fulfilled only when all of the related provisions are kept. 
an additional issue must consider the scope of the provisions. In the consideration of the historical progress of commitments, the question of the scope of these commitments is particularly relevant. The scope of a promise or a covenant may involve a series of actions, all of which are necessary to keep the commitment in an exhaustive sense. Then the first action of the series would keep the commitment in an inaugural or initial sense. These issues may be illustrated in the following manner. So listen to this simple illustration. Suppose that I made a promise to a first-year student to pay for his college education. It all sounds simple enough. Would the first-year payment for the next semester's tuition keep the promise? Yes. In all inaugural sense, but not in an exhaustive sense. In some future semester, if I for some reason chose to make a similar payment for the student's wife, would I fulfill the commitment? No, because she wasn't included. It seems clear that the initial commitment was made to the student and his education, and thus must be kept with him. The pact that I paid for the student's wife is a blessing to her and unrelated to the promise I initially made to the student. Such an illustration is relevant when some claim that the covenant blessings given to the church constitute an inaugural or partial fulfillment of a covenant agreed upon with Israel. The confusion in terms of agreement seems clear, and something else must be happening as the church is blessed. The Fulfillment of the Abrahamic Covenant The covenant was instituted with Abraham at a point of new revelation in his relationship with God. The covenant, however, was not inaugurated in fulfillment either during his life or that of Isaac or Jacob. Yet, it's important to recognize that individual promises that were provisions of the covenant were fulfilled if only in an inaugural or partial fashion. A simple list of promises that the sequential statements that represent some degree of fulfillment would demonstrate the point. So they were blessed in these areas, made your name great in these areas, shall be a blessing, curse him a curse you many descendants. These instances in Genesis illustrate the provisions of a covenant may be fulfilled in some sense after it's been instituted, even though the covenant as a whole has not been inaugurated in fulfillment. The same interpretive perspective is reflected in Exodus 6. Casuto captures the interpretation of the following restatement. I revealed myself, God declares to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and my aspects to find expression in the name Shaddai. And I made them fruitful and multiply them and gave them children and children's children, but by the name Yahweh, in my character as expressed by this designation, I was not known to them. That is, it was not given to them to recognize me as the one that fulfills his promises because assurance with regard to the possession of the land which I had given them, I had not yet fulfilled. This perspective on fulfillment is then developed in the narrative of Moses and Joshua in the generation. In particular, the narrative in Joshua introduces the inaugural or partial fulfillment of the covenant as given to Abraham. And in the narrative, what is meant by inaugural or partial fulfillment is clearly portrayed. An issue or summary statements which are both included in the text and which might appear to be mutually contradictory. The first statement summarizes what happened to the promises or provisions of the covenant. All of these provisions were kept. Boiling and Wright's translation captured this sense. Yahweh entrusted to Israel all the land, which he had promised on oath to their ancestors to give. They took possession of it, and there they settled down. Yahweh brought about a cessation of the hostilities toward them on every side, in strict conformity to the ancestral promise. And no one successfully withstood him out of all their enemies. All their enemies Yahweh subjected to them. Not a word of all the good word which Yahweh had spoken to the house of Israel proved untrue. It all happened. So you got all the land, all the enemies, all God's word. It all happened. So it says inaugural fulfillment include the keeping of all the provisions of the covenant. Yet it is inaugural or partial because of the limited scope. The limitation is indicated in the secondary summary statement in, in, in Joshua 13, 1 through 7. When Joshua had reached a ripe old age, Yahweh said to Joshua, Although you have reached a ripe old age, much of the land remains to be taken. 
This is the land that remains. So he's telling how much of the land needs to be taken. So that shows you that the land was not fulfilled. So 13. Thus, while all the provisions have been kept, not all the provisions have been met to the extent promised. Thus, the covenant was partially fulfilled. Uh, one final question remains. Was the land given to Abraham's descendants? At the outside, the pro outset, the promised land was given. Uh, entrusted to them, and therefore they're taken. Joshua 1, 3, and 6. For the transaction to give to be concluded, the gift must be received. Otherwise, the gift is only offered or left out there on the table. To be given, it had to be received. It is clear that Joshua's generation did not take or receive all of the land. Boiling and right thus translate the term give, Natan, used three times, nuanced in the context, entrusted to give, subjected. The verses display three uses of the verb Natan with the three distinct nuances, thus underscoring the free and gracious initiatives of Yahweh toward the house of Israel. Thus, all the land had been entrusted to be taken, but not all of it was taken. What had been given to Abraham, he received. And then because Abraham obeyed, it was entrusted to Isaac and to Joshua for occupation. But no descendant or generation or descendants took all that had been given to Abraham. Not even David took all the sense of occupying it all with Israelites in possession of the land. Thus, the covenant remained unfulfilled in a final and complete sense, while Israel occupied only portions of the land. Their occupation of the land continued until it was forfeited in God's judgment on their evil in 722 and 586 BC. So that's the Syrian and Babylonian captivity. The inaugurated covenant now went into abeyance or into a temporary inactivity. Even though the provision of numerous descendants of Abraham continued to be fulfilled in spite of captivity. Thus, what had been given to Abraham had not yet been given to his descendants. In addition... God prophesied the length of the deportation to be 70 years. As a result, Daniel, near the end of the prophesied time, prayed on the basis of it to God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Nehemiah prayed similarly. In these prayers, God is viewed as open to keep and thus fulfill his covenant, but it is available only to those who love him and keep his commandments. These are ones who, by their obedience, put themselves in a position to receive what God waited to give. Okay. Israel's history unfolds to disclose in hindsight that there were none who fully loved nor any who completely kept his commandments until Jesus of Nazareth came to fulfill God's will. He came to be obedient to the will of the Father and expressed it in the ultimate act of obedience and death on the cross. So it was that the father raised him from the dead and having ascended to an exalted position, he received the father's promise. Thus Paul concludes now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. He does not say into seeds as though there were many, but is only one to your seed who is Christ. This is the fulfillment of a provision of the seed to whom the blessing is given. Now the exhaustive fulfillment of the covenant awaits the father's display of mercy on all the seed of Abraham, so that they would receive the seed and what he would uh, give, the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant was given unilaterally as Yahweh promised a Davidic house in response to David's offer to build Yahweh house. The provisions of the covenant were, in, were unconditionally given even though one provision was a condition, assuring God's discipline of each royal son who sinned. While a record of institution of the covenant does not appear in the text, later revelation recognizes the institution, 2 Samuel 23, and the inauguration of the covenant, Psalms 89. The inaugural fulfillment of the covenant rested upon revelation given in the Torah, Deuteronomy 17. That revelation specified the two factors associated with the establishment of a monarchy. First, the people were given the freedom to choose a monarchy. They then had the responsibility to establish a monarchy by setting a king over them, but only a king of Yahweh's choosing. Second, Yahweh would choose the one from among the Israelites who would be king. 
In the history of the people in the land, God's choice was communicated by the prophets. The prophets was thus the kingmaker. Thus the monarchy involved both Yahweh's choice of who would be king and the people's appointment or placing them upon the, the throne of the anointed one. A brief history of the early monarchy will clarify how the choice and the appointment appear in the nation. Saul was chosen by Yahweh through Samuel to be king, after which the people held him as their king, long lived the king. Since there were some who spurned him, it was only after he was proven in defense of the men of Jabesh that the kingship was renewed, and all the people made him king in Gigal. In a similar fashion, David was chosen by Yahweh and anointed by Samuel to be king. However, it wasn't until after Saul had died that the men of Judah came and anointed King David over the house of Judah. From that time, David was king in Hebron. Seven years and six months later, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. King David made a pact with them before Yahweh, as he formally agreed to also represent Israel's interests, and they anointed David king over Israel. Thus, the people's appointment was an official formal agreement sealed with an act of anointing by all the people. The Davidic covenant was inaugurated when the first king was enthroned from the family of David. Although Absalom claimed the choice of the people, the Adijah claimed the choice of leadership. Neither was chosen by Yahweh. Both lacked the support of a prophet of God. Yahweh's choice of Solomon originated with Nathan the prophet. The people's appointment was originally stated by David to Bathsheba, that her son would rule. Solomon was joined by leadership who represented the people, Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaniah the military commander. Based on the Davidic covenant, the people sought to make one of David's sons king. It wasn't until after the heavy hand of Rehoboam rebuffed the people that Israel abandoned the Davidic era. This appointment of the people followed Yahweh's discipline of Solomon as the prophet Azure revealed Yahweh's choice to divide the kingdom and to choose Jeroboam. This divine, this discipline did not represent an abandonment of the Davidic covenant. So Rehoboam reigned over some of the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. As the Abrahamic covenant went into abeyance when the nation left the land and went into captivity, so also went the Davidic covenant. There was a lapse in the inaugurated Davidic covenant as the succession of the throne kings in Jerusalem ceased. Yet, as in the Abrahamic covenant, provisions in the covenant continued to be kept. The continuance is reflected when Babylon releases Jehoiachin from prison and acknowledges his right to royalty. So in each generation, one would exist within the right to royalty, even though Yahweh in discipline failed to support that right. God disregarded each heir's claim to the throne until the birth of Jesus. His rightful claim to the throne of his father David was carefully noted by Matthew, as the legal heirs are listed from captivity to Joseph. Further, all four Gospels record Yahweh's anointing of Jesus with the Holy Spirit and adoption of him as son. Thus, the provision of an eternal house had been kept during the times of the Gentiles, but the provision of throne and kingdom awaited the people's response to God's choice. That response came to a focus of the triumphal entry and the resulting crucifixion. The multitudes who went along, whom Luke specified as the multitude of disciples, pronounced praise to God for the coming of the son of David. Yet before Pilate, the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes to call for him to be crucified. From early in his ministry, many Pharisees have resisted his claim to be king. And as he staged entry into Jerusalem, even more resisted. The chief priest describes the elders assembled as the Sanhedrin at Caiaphas' house and plotted to kill Jesus. Caiaphas ironically reasoned that it was expedient that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish. Their decision to reject his claim to the Davidic throne was unanimous in the people's cry to crucify him. The chief priests in particular rejected him as king of the Jews, concluding they would not have him rule over them. The evidence of the people's decision is clear and established without any doubt. A dispensational stress on the people's response has led some to draw a faulty inference. That inference pauses the dispensationalism held out the possibility in the people's choice. 
that the political kingdom of, of Messiah might have been established before the cross. Thus, the dispensationalist model misrepresents God's decreed will, which pauses the cross before the kingdom. This inference is faulty for two reasons. First, even though the people must enthrone the king of God's choice, yet during the time of the Gentiles, Rome remained in position to make the final decision. Thus, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and wept, he acknowledged his contingency from a human point of view. Had Jerusalem recognized the time of her visitation and received God's Messiah, Jesus would have protected Jerusalem as a mother hen gathers and protects her chicks from the inevitable invasion by Rome. As a mother hen, he would have died at the hand of Rome for Jerusalem. The call for Israel's decision was real. Second, even though Jesus' first advent involved a real presentation of the kingdom, yet it would not be realized fulfillment during the first advent. The first advent called for a real decision and provided the real anointed one from God. Had not the multitudes recognized this reality in the uh, triumphal entry, the very stones as witnesses would have cried out, about the truth. And yet, at the same time, the ultimate determination of a generation decision had been decreed and revealed by God. That decision, according to the Mosaic Covenant responsibility, rested in the position of the nation and in the hands of evil men in Rome. Thus, it would never have been a realized Davidic kingdom, let alone the already or inaugurated fulfillment of the Davidic Covenant without the cross first. While the first advent of Jesus Christ does not represent a partial fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, it does represent a fulfillment in part concerning the provisions of the Son of David. After Jesus' death, God recognized his right to life when he raised him from among the dead. Further, God exalted him in glory in his own right hand, where he was seated in ascent to God's throne. There are at least three consequences to the fulfillment of this provision of sonship that the New Testament examines. A fulfillment of the promised relationship with the son of David, Psalms 2-7. The Davidic covenant had promised an adopted relationship between the father and each Davidic son. Such an adopted relationship involved the share in God's life, initially in God's correcting presence in the reign of the son and that presence in mercy. Preeminently, adoption involved the share by anointing and enthroning to rule in God's stead. The language of Psalms 2 about God's anointed set on the throne in Jerusalem speaks of sonship that is presented in the New Testament to speak of an unlimited share in life. During Jesus' life, this share in God's life as son was proclaimed at his baptism. This unqualified pronouncement of the Father's pleasure indicated that Jesus had shared the Father's life without limit during his growing up years. All that remained was sharing it through all of life's experiences. At the Transfiguration, those experiences have been enlarged to include the temptation from Satan, the confrontations with the Jewish leaders resulting in their rejection, and even the slowness of the disciples to believe. In all this, God pronounced him to be his son, whose words would represent him in unqualified truth. In resurrection, Jesus' share in life as the son was completed. The ultimate surrender of human life came in death when Jesus voluntarily gave his life to the Father. Now only life from the Father could resurrect the life that was Jesus, and in resurrection he was thus designated to be the Son of God. Now in resurrection it was evident for all to see that the life he had was life from God alone. Okay, so that was the, a fulfillment of the promised relationship with the Son of David, a fulfillment of the promised position of the Son of David. Psalms 89 explores the promise that the Davidic covenant would last forever. Such longevity could survive only if the Davidic descendants shared the life and position of God. Israel had enjoyed an exalted position corporately, addressing God as my father, and they had been called his firstborn and the highest. The psalmist borrowed these exalted terms to refer to the position of the son of David as firstborn. Now in... Ding! the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, they aptly refer to his present position as firstborn over all creation. This position of preeminence is a fulfillment in part of the promise of sonship forever 
and in anticipation of the promise of an eternal throne and kingdom. An introduction based upon the prototype ministry of Melchizedek of a new ministry for the son of David. This is a sub point. The present ministry of Jesus as Lord is not the result of the Davidic order as reflected in Psalms 2 and 89. While Jesus had been chosen by Yahweh to be anointed, he had not been made king by Israel. Rather, he had been made Lord by Yahweh himself and Yahweh alone in his ascension and enthronement. And this is the position and authority of the order of Melchizedek. The author of the book of Yahweh argues that the order of Melchizedek is based on criteria other than that which have been seen in the order of David. So this is the, the criteria. It is the order based on superiority and position to Abraham rather than descent from Abraham. It is the order based on authoritative appearance in history rather than on a claim to authority based on descent from a line with promised blessings. It is the order based on righteousness and peace found in the realm over which his name pronounces rule rather than a discipline of sin in David's line. It is the order based on an ending life rather than a succession of lives in office. I've got to get through this chapter. Thus, the rule and ministry of Jesus in the order of Melchizedek is accessed by believers in him and his word or access. It is that rule which Jesus introduced in the parable of the mystery of the kingdom in which the word of the king produces life and fruitfulness in those who hear, believe. Uh, let me read that again. It's the rule of ministry of Jesus in order of Ooh, okay, I'm not sure I agree with his interpretation of Matthew 13 there, but that's fine. Um, I'll pay more attention in his more recent book and see how he evaluates that. Fulfillment of the New Covenant. To appropriately consider the New Covenant, we must begin with the consideration of the... So remember, we've looked at the Abrahamic, we looked at the Davidic, and now we're looking at the New Covenant. I wish he wouldn't went into the land covenant. That's all right. To appropriately consider the new covenant, we must begin with the consideration of the servant of the Lord as Isaiah did. The gospels all tell the story of Jesus anointing for the will and I think probably ministry. Yeah, the ministry of God, the Father, at his baptism. It is clear that he arrived in Jerusalem as the anointed son of David. The emphasis of the gospel accounts, however, presents him as the servant anointed to serve the nation in his sinful condition. The narrative in Luke 4 is at first sight remarkable for its first major example of Christ's public ministry. Yet it makes a fitting introduction to Christ's public ministry. To identify him and his mission, Christ cited Isaiah 61 at 58, and it recalls the way Luke identified John and his mission in 3, 4 through 6. By a similar quotation from Isaiah. <coughs> Matthew, also uh, known for his focus on Jesus the King, presented him in ministry as the suffering servant and as the servant in spirit. Although Jesus was anointed to rule, he was given to the nation as his first event as servant of the Lord, anointed to serve. The popular expectation, however, was that he would be king. While this expectation was correct, the expectation obscured the order that suffering service must precede glory and rule. When the gathered crowd attempted by force to make him king, he withdrew to be alone. When the crowds later found him, he pressed him to receive the sacrifice that he would make of himself. As a result, many disciples went back and walked with him no more. When he challenged the twelve, they responded that they had accepted his words as the source of eternal life. This does not suggest that they had put together their expectation with his teaching that he must suffer. It simply means that his words were more important than their present expectations. The gospel narrative presents the one anointed to serve whose words promise life. While the remnant that received him did not represent the nation so as to make him king, still the remnant did represent Israelites to whom the servant had been given as a covenant. And so he met to celebrate the Jewish Passover with his disciples. He introduced a memorial meal. In particular, the cup introduced his blood to be what would institute the new covenant. Unlike the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants, the new covenant 
was not instituted in the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus was given as the covenant that was about to be instituted. The language of Isaiah 42 and 49 using Natan, given as a covenant, means to institute or establish a covenant rather than to inaugurate fulfillment of the covenant. The distinction between institution and inauguration and fulfillment must be clarified further. Yeah, I wish you would have clarified it earlier in the book because you've been using it all throughout the book, but I, it was it's difficult to grasp. Because in our mindset, I'm thinking, okay, the president is inaugurated before he actually takes office. You know, so what's going on there? Um, but that's from our context. To institute a promissory covenant is to introduce provisions of the agreement which are now available to receive. Okay. To inaugurate fulfillment is to keep all the provisions of the of the agreement. Okay. Got you. So to institute is to introduce, keep that in mind, guys, the provisions that are available. And to inaugurate means to um, to keep all the provisions. So let me think how, let's see, inaugurate. I'm going to do it like this. To inaugurate means to consummate. Or to inaugurate means to culminate. Maybe, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll try that working idea. The new covenant was instituted only after the death of Christ, the mediator of the covenant, and then he and the provisions of the covenant were offered to the nation following his resurrection and ascension. Some of the provisions were then made available and given at the remnant gathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost. The new covenant will be inaugurated in fulfillment when Israel as a nation will accomplish her national destiny. In this way, some of the provisions... Acts 2.38 were offered as the promise of Christ is given to you and your children and to all who are far off. These provisions, the forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Spirit, are given to as many as the Lord God will call. The national offer was rejected by the national leaders, and thus inauguration of fulfillment was postponed, but the same provisions were made available to the Gentiles as well. Okay, I got it. So an institution means that the blessings are available. But inauguration means that the blessings have been culminated. Those provisions now became the basis for the ministry described by Paul and the author of the book of Hebrews. For Paul, the ministry of the apostles, namely setting the direction for the church, is the ministry provision of the new covenant. In this context, the ministry would entail the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Central to the church's worship is the Lord's Supper, where the cup is the occasion to remember the institution of the new covenant. The perspective of Paul's gospel is to receive Christ, in whom are offered these provisions of the new covenant. As we saw with the Abrahamic covenant, the provisions of the covenant were available to be received by faith by the patriarchs before the inauguration or fulfillment of all the covenant provisions that awaited the generation of Moses and Joshua. The provisions of these two covenants are combined by Paul as he develops the ministry to the Gentiles. So in Galatians, the provision of the Holy Spirit was received by these Gentiles. And the reception came in the provisions promised to Abraham that in all you nations will be blessed. Uh, so quoting those passages. The author of the book of Hebrews reasoned on the basis of Christ's resurrection and ascension, Hebrews 8 1. Based on his position, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. From his position, some of the provisions of the better covenant are now available. Further from his position, all the provisions are now ready to be inaugurated with the nation of Israel in the future. This representation of some of the provisions of the Abrahamic and New Covenants now available to Gentiles corresponds to the imagery of the natural olive tree in Romans 11. As some of the natural branches are broken off, the original olive tree does not realize the outcome from which it was planted. As wild olive branches are grafted in, they enjoy some of the provisions of being an olive tree without becoming natural olive branches or fulfilling the role of the tree. Rather, as Paul leaves the metaphor for a moment, he talks about a time 
when the fullness of the Gentile opportunity will have come to an end. After that, the wild olive branches will be removed, and natural branches again will be grafted in the tree, and then all Israel will be saved. Then both the Abrahamic and New Covenant will be inaugurated in their fulfillment, and the natural olive tree, the nation of Israel, will realize this designed in. However, those who argue for an inaugural fulfillment of the New Covenant at Jesus' first event have challenged these above-mentioned traditional conclusions and thereby need to be addressed. 1. John the Baptist promised one mightier than he who would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Progressive dispensationalists argued that Jesus fulfilled John the Baptist's statement and inaugurated the fulfillment of the New Covenant when the baptism of the Spirit occurred in Acts 2. In fact, Blazing proposes that this is an aspect of Messiah's ministry in the history of redemption. As such, the ministry of spirit baptism is no longer distinctive to the church age, but is normative in the fulfillment of the ministry of the new covenant. Blazing's proposal will be addressed by first advancing the claim for a distinctive ministry of spirit baptism, and then second by challenging the claim that the pouring out of the spirit and the baptism of the spirit are identical. The claim that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a distinctive term in ministry in the church rests first on its appearance in Acts. Uh, spirit baptism in Acts is related to the birth and formation of the church. The ministry of the Spirit that was about to happen is defined by a promise from the Father, but spoken by Christ. The promise was first spoken by John the Baptist. This distinguishing relationship will be considered. First, Jesus adds that the men of the Spirit baptism was about to happen. In Acts 1 5. As the church is born in Acts 2, neither Luke nor Peter describe the work of spirit as baptism. Okay. Terms such as filling, prophecy, and speaking in other language describe the ministry of the spirit. Thus, the ministry of baptism is implied in context, but is not necessary to mention. The term baptism, however, does appear when the spirit's ministry unexpectedly incorporates Cornelius into the body of believers in Acts 11 which was described as the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Thus, baptism is used to define what had happened in the formation of the church, but other terms are also used to describe aspects of the total experience of the Spirit. Thus, when the defining term baptism appears in the writings of Paul and Peter, the traditional expectation is that the theological components of the Spirit's ministry will be developed. This is the second argument to advance the term is referring to a distinctive aspect of the Spirit's ministry. The ministry of the Spirit thus describes the formation of the body of believers with diverse members unified by the common Spirit. In addition, it describes those members as identified in Christ's experience of death and resurrection, which introduces the potential of a believer's new life in Christ. The third reason to interpret baptism as referring to a distinctive ministry of the Spirit is the field of terms used to describe the Spirit's ministries. The field of terms filled, and dwelt, drink, seal, baptize, gift, guide, assure, and prayer do not appear in context presenting them as synonyms, but rather appear as distinct in emphasis, even though they are related works of the Spirit. Thus, based on New Testament usage, which is the only biblical usage, we have good reason to conclude that baptism is not a comprehensive term but rather descriptive of what God does in giving birth to and form in the church. This claim for distinct usage must also refute the claim the spirit baptism is synonymous with the spirit's new covenant ministry. The first and strongest arguments rest in John the Baptist's introduction to Israel of her Messiah as distinguished by the ministry of baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire. Blazing uh, challenges dispensationalists to define spirit baptism in the context of Old Testament promises, even as they're prone to define baptism with fire in the context of Old Testament. He makes two points. The term baptism does not occur in the Old Testament for either fire uh, or spirit, and yet the image of fire is used in the Old Testament to interpret John's words. Should that not also apply to the spirit? When the three Old Testament passages, the promised spirit are examined, Isaiah, Joel, and Ezekiel, no basis is found to explain John the Baptist's image. The presence of two themes of water and spirit poured out by God suggests a link between the passages, but certainly does not establish any connection. 
Ezekiel 36 speaks of the spirit indwelling, but with a different ministry than described in spirit baptism. While Isaiah's promise of the pouring out of God's spirit is related to the ministry of the servant, it is insufficient by itself to be the basis on what John the Baptist announced. Therefore, the substance of the ministry of the Messiah has its origin in the wording of John the Baptist, who spoke in particular as a prophet. The problem that dispensationalists then face is that John was a prophet to Israel, and the direct object of the reference, you, Messiah will baptize you, is clearly the Israelites. This raises a problem for those who distinguish between Israel and the church, since this promise of the Father addressed to Israel is fulfilled in the forming of the church in Acts. Does this not provide a basis for taking Israel's promise as fulfilled in the church? From the viewpoint of the historical participants, no awareness exists at this time of God's introduction of the church. Yet from God's point of view, the church did exist. This was the first event prophecy to Israel. While the Old Testament had clarified the distinction between Messiah's suffering and Messiah's glories that would follow, it did not clarify how they were related. Peter, as a historical participant, came to understand that the first advent had to be followed by Messiah's heavenly session. The length of the heavenly session remained unknown, but the fact of the session separated the sufferings from the glory. As the first advent promised, the promise to Israel is not a national promise, but is historically related to Messiah's first advent, and thus simply related to Messiah and his session in heaven, separated from believers on earth. John the Baptist thus fashions his description of Messiah's ministry as similar to his own ministry, yet clearly John's ministry was inferior in element. What is the point in the similarity? Dockery suggests that water baptism identified a repentant remnant with John and a shared consciousness of Messiah's coming. Thus, spirit baptism would identify those whose response to Messiah in a spiritually effective fashion to him and the benefits of his suffering, it would form his body on earth. The final argument against the identification of spirit baptism with Israel's new covenant is based upon a failure to appreciate the subtle distinction that the Lord makes in the beginning of Acts. After having introduced his baptism with the Holy Spirit, the disciples asked if this meant that the kingdom was being restored to Israel. While the disciples were not to know when the kingdom would be restored to Israel, they were to relate the coming of the Spirit with power given to them in their impending witness. Thus, the supposed connection between Spirit baptism and the new covenant ministry and the restored kingdom to Israel was not supported in these words of the Lord. Although the arguments are strong supporting the thesis that Spirit baptism is distinct to the formation of the church, they may not be conclusive. There are reasons that lend support to the idea that the effects of spirit baptism are normative for any believer in Christ's finished work. Certain conclusions, however, need to be mentioned. First, spirit baptism is not comprehensive of all the provisions of the new covenant. Rather, it is only a component of one provision of the covenant. The pouring out of the Spirit. Second, the unity of diverse members in the group of the church is in need of overarching spirit of unification more than a nation which is both governmental and ethnic unity. Thus, one of the effects of spirit baptism is uniquely necessary to the new entity of the church. Third, the Spirit's identification of the believer with the experience of Christ on the cross and a resurrection is uniquely appropriate to a group known as the body of Christ. While it would be a helpful blessing to members of a nation, it is essential to members of the body. Two. Hey, Jamie. I just saw to your messaging. I have been reading this on my channel. Cool. Layman Simmer. You've been reading what? What I've been reading? Or what? Or do you have this book? Uh, the Israel God and Prophecy Principles. Okay. I got you. All right, thank you for letting me know what you've been reading on your channel. Uh, Peter's explanation of the phenomenon of Pentecost based on Joel 2. Progressive dispensationists argue that Joel 2 introduces the fulfillment of the new covenant. It is not without significance that Peter found a context to explain what had just happened at Pentecost in the promises to Israel found in Joel. While reference to Jesus' words or John's words would have been true, that is what John spoke about, they would not have had the recognized authority nor the breadth of discussion found in Joel. P. 
Peter does not insist on a total discontinuity between the church and Old Testament saints. Rather, this promise of the Spirit not only explains the prophetic utterances being made, but it also anticipates what was impending in God's dealing with Israel and judgment. The point of connection between the phenomena of Pentecost and the prophetic passages is found in Peter's phrase, this is that. While this is not a direct announcement of fulfillment, plerao, it is come run pesture mode of interpretation used to refer to contemporary fulfillment. The extent of that fulfillment depends upon the reference this and the text or corresponding explanation that. Clearly the antecedent of this is we hear them speaking in their own tongues and wonderful works of God. In the text, the that is the portion that corresponds to I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. What corresponded was what they heard and what Joel announced that they would say. Joel's explanation traced this to the outpouring of the spirit in the last days. As Zane Hodges concludes, Peter meant to say that the outpouring of the Spirit fulfilled Joel's prophecy, yet it appears that Joel's prophecy about signs and wonders is not fulfilled here or anywhere else in Acts either. For that matter, this prophecy... Oh, my nose. One second, guys. Okay. Oh, I see Jamie, same subject. Probably from a different theological bent though. Um let's see, where was I? I'm assuming I'm right here. I'll just go right there. Let's see. Although the arguments of strong support in the thesis of spirit baptism is distinct to the formation of church, they may not be conclusive. There are reasons that lend support to the idea that the effects of spirit baptism are normative. Okay, I already read that. Okay, so I guess I'm right here then. Never, so again, we have a fulfillment of the provision of the covenant that does not represent an inaugural fulfillment of Israel's covenant. Rather, as Peter seems to say in Acts 3, national covenant blessing is contingent upon the repentance of the nation's leaders. While the church was not self-consciously separate from Israel yet, added revelation would unfold the distinctive work of God in the church as Gentiles become equal partners of Christ in the body. Since this does not represent an inaugural fulfillment, it is erroneous to conclude, as Bach does, another progressive dispensationalist, that the allusion to Joel's fulfill, fulfills the new covenant. The error of this conclusion is found in two reasons. First, the new covenant provisions, as found in Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8, do not even mention the Holy Spirit. Thus, taking the ministry of the Holy Spirit to define or at least to represent the covenant as a part used in place of the whole does not find support in this central passage, which often is used to spell out the covenant. Second, there is an error in logic. The logical fallacy that progressive dispensationalism makes is the linking is not equivalent to identification. The New Testament acknowledge that the Spirit is one provision of the New Covenant that is being fulfilled, but one provision that does not equal all provisions. Rather, Joel's revelation predicts a prophetic endowment brought to pass by the outpoured Spirit of God. According to Peter, this prophetic endowment was fulfilled at Pentecost. The conclusion of covenant fulfillment that Bach reaches is not the result of textual reasoning, but rather a theological reasoning. The line of reasoning must now be examined. Three, the interpretation of an inaugural fulfillment of the covenant based on theological reasoning, where a progressive dispensationalist, I didn't know that, states directly, or I didn't grasp who he was. Well, I did because I read his Trinity book um, back then, I think, and I really liked it. So I guess I didn't catch this. But I read this back in 2010, I think it was. So 
where progressive dispensation states directly the problem that dispensationists have been struggling with. How can the church, a multi-ethnic, a multinational spiritual organism, not given any such promise of national identity or land possession, participate in the same new covenant given to Israel? That is the question with which we struggle as we attempt to interpret Old Testament texts based on their own context, consistent literal interpretation. The answer that we are proposed recognizes the influence and in fact governs some of the meaning that's interpreted. The answer here requires the application of the other theological considerations mentioned above. Namely, the already not yet eschatological framework. In other words, the meaning of the text is expanded to include the church along with Israel based upon a theological framework. This leads to an alteration in the meaning of New, Test New Covenant texts. The fulfillment of New Covenant text is described as inaugural fulfillment of the covenant. That leads based on the theological framework to select only the spiritual aspects of a New Covenant promise as fulfilled, and this is necessitated by the fact of ongoing sin and disobedience in the lives of New Covenant participants. The represents an alternative text meaning based on theological selections. Those selections force some to ask whether the agreements with the covenant do in fact represent fulfillment. Thus, the approach of progressive dispensationalism in regard to the new covenant must be rejected for textual and hermeneutical reasons. Okay. Conclusion. Dispensationalism has been known for its emphasis on discontinuity. But as this examination of the promissory covenants has shown, this discontinuity is not absolute. Continuity exists in the fulfillment of some of the provisions of the covenant made with Israel. At the same time, it's important to recognize that this view of continuity is not the proposed in an inaugural or partial fulfillment of Israel's covenants. The fulfillment of individual provisions is based on a consistent literal treatment of the text rather than fulfillment of covenants which is based on the already not yet theology developed in the New Testament. An examination of individual texts finds continuity in the unilateral and unconditional agreement with Yahweh assumed in each of the promissory covenants. When the agreement involves Yahweh, I will, he assumes ultimate responsibility in word to accomplish what has been promised to Israel. Even in a unilateral and unconditional covenant, it still remains an agreement which shares responsibility to participate in fulfillment with Israel. This responsibility may be only to receive what was promised and to believe that God will keep the provisions that he had promised. But when we propose unconditional promises and shared responsibility together, this seems to constitute a contradistinction. This apparent contradistinction finds a resolution when the relationship between continuity and discontinuity is examined. In the Abrahamic covenant, the final responsibility is stated in word in the promises of the provisions. The central provision of the covenant is that a land will be given to Abraham's descendants, which applies both the birth of the descendants and the one or a generation of descendants that will be willing to receive what was promised and will be able to mediate blessings, which was promised for all nations. While God's promise assured without condition that there would be one or more such descendants, the question of how this would occur remain unspecified. In the Davidic covenant, Yahweh once again assumes the final responsibility in a unilateral and unconditional agreement in word. The agreement again shared responsibility with such a son or a line of sons who would be involved in fulfillment of God's reign over the kingdom of Israel and that forever. In other words, the provisions of the covenant implied that a son or a line of sons would appear who would be willing and able to reign in God's stead forever. In the New Covenant, Yahweh not only assumes final responsibility in word and specifying the promised provisions of the covenant with Israel, but he also assumes the responsibility that was shared with Israel as God's servant. Thus, the responsibility was assumed in the person of the servant. In the accomplishment of the servant, an agreement would be instituted through, uh, through which Israel's servant would accomplish his share of responsibility. The Abrahamic, Davidic, and New Covenants all converge in the implied promise of a descendant, and the promise of a son who would be begotten of God, and the promise of a, a okay, I, I'm getting this, and the promise of the servant, Yahweh's arm, who would serve in the service would become the basis of the agreement through which Israel would serve. This one who would be willing to receive uh, uh, and be able to fulfill all that God promises God himself, who takes Israel's share as the descendant of Abraham. The agreement then is the covenant that Israelites must be willing to receive and Gentiles are invited to see. By what they see, Gentiles are invited to see God for themselves. 
This discontinuity is disclosed in the individual text described, the first advent in which the covenant partner Israel as a nation rejected the son of Abraham and the son of David, who, ding, was the servant. The covenants are unconditional because God would assume Israel's share, but God does not replace Israel in accomplishing her share when Israel rejects him. That would be Walkie's position representing amillennialism. Nor does it reinterpret Israel's share where Israel rejects him. That would be Lad's position representing historic premillennialism. Nor does God expand those who share in fulfillment of Israel's role temporarily when Israel rejects him. That would be a blessings and box position representing progressive dispensationalism. Rather, God sets aside the nation temporarily and incorporates believing Gentiles along with the believing Jewish remnant to continue the ministry of the servant until he returns as the son of David and the son of Abraham for judgment and rule. That ministry is based on provisions of the new covenant received by faith in the provision of Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. This setting aside of the nation servant creates the discontinuity and the fulfillment of covenant agreements with Israel. Therefore, all covenant agreements with Israel will be inaugurated in fulfillment when Israel receives the one whom they crucified, the son of David, the son of Abraham, when he returns. Zechariah 12 10. Okay. <clears throat> Jamie, I'll, I'll answer that question later on in the future. But I believe that the distinctions are, are sociological. So can Israel be thought of as a people? Yeah, sociologically, yes. It, it that Sociologically refers to grouping. It is an, an entity. Is it, it is an entity established by Christ. Yeah, it's a theocracy. The theocracy of Israel. Okay. And and then the, the, the body of Christ, the metaphorical body of Christ, the church is is an entity as well uh but but what has christ inaugurated for right now i'm going to say i don't know and i'm going to conclude there not because i'm trying to avoid jamie's discussions and drilling but i've just read a whole chapter and i need to get back to maybe writing or i don't know i need to engage things in a different way um, so anyway, if this blessed y'all, subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell if you want notifications. Share this with others if you think it will benefit them. Most of all, keep this ministry in prayer. And if you feel like you've been blessed by this ministry, you can donate through PayPal, which is underneath the About section or underneath most videos. God bless.